Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Furlong and today we're talking about energy transformations within ecosystems. We're going to explore how energy flows in an ecosystem in this video. This can all be shown in a very simple diagram called a food web. A food web shows us the flow of energy in an ecosystem. For example, here is a food web. What we see are organisms and arrows. The arrows show the direction that the energy is moving. So for instance, if we look at the great blue heron and say the frog, we see the arrow going from the frog to the heron, which indicates that the heron ate the frog. So the energy is going from the frog to the heron. If we take a closer look at this food web, we can see that most organisms have arrows going to it. So we can see where their energy is coming from. But if you notice over here, things like, if you notice over here, things like pond weeds and cattails and the plankton, well they don't have any arrows going towards it. So where are they getting their energy? That's right, they're getting their energy from the sun. So the sun is providing energy and that is how they get their energy. Those are the autotrophs. Now the size of an ecosystem is limited to the amount of energy entering it through the producers. All energy that is coming into an ecosystem of course is coming from the sun and only the producers can absorb that light energy and make food from it. So what is this energy used for? Well, these plants and all the autotrophs need it to grow and maintain themselves. All those things needed for life requires energy. All the rest of the energy is used to supply the ecosystem. This is what's known as the net primary productivity of an ecosystem. Of course, the more autotrophs you have, the more energy that can enter into the ecosystem. Uh, that also then means that there's going to be more energy available for all the other consumers in that ecosystem. What this means is that with a higher primary productivity, there's going to be more energy available for consumers in that ecosystem. Hence, then there's going to be more consumers. We can see this energy in another way by looking at what's called an energy pyramid. Here's an example of an energy pyramid. We have energy on one side of the pyramid and organisms on the other side of the pyramid. Notice that there are, what do we have, one, two, three, four, five different layers, if you will, to this energy pyramid. Those are called trophic levels. And one way we can think of this is that each one of these is a different step in the food web. And we'll take a look at that here shortly. Let's write some organisms' names on this energy pyramid. At the very bottom, that, that lowest trophic level, these are the producers. So these are all the autotrophs. These are the organisms that are capturing sunlight and making food. They're producing the food. Those organisms that eat producers are called primary consumers. Now in the previous video we said that these are herbivores. They're not only herbivores but they could also be omnivores as well. Any organism that eats a primary consumer for its energy is called a secondary consumer. And these would definitely be things like carnivores but it also could be omnivores as well. If an organism gets its energy from a secondary consumer it is known as a tertiary consumer and if an organism gets its energy from a tertiary consumer it's called a quaternary consumer. Now notice as we increase these trophic levels the area of each level decreases and we look at it that way because in an ecosystem there are going to be much fewer quaternary consumers than there will be tertiary consumers and there's certainly a lot more primary consumers than secondary consumers and in an ecosystem the greatest number of organisms are the producers. Well, Let's look at this in terms of energy. Let's say that in a small ecosystem there's about 510,000 kilocalories of energy is absorbed by the producers. Now some of those producers are going to be using that energy in order to maintain themselves, but 
primary consumers are going to eat these producers as well. Of the 510,000 kilocalories that's available to the primary consumers, they only actually get about 51,000 kilocalories. And then when a secondary consumer comes along and eats a primary consumer, of those 51,000 kilocalories, they're only getting 5,100 kilocalories, certainly a lot less. And then a tertiary consumer, if it eats a secondary consumer, is only getting 510 of those kilocalories. And lastly, a quaternary consumer, if it eats a tertiary consumer, is only getting 51 of those kilocalories. Now think about it like this. If that quaternary consumer needs 51 kilocalories of energy every day to survive, which is actually a fairly low number, that means that the ecosystem has to provide 510,000 kilocalories of energy at the producer level every day just to maintain that one individual. So certainly there's a lot of energy that is being absorbed by these producers. Uh, but it also shows us why there cannot be very many quaternary consumers in an ecosystem. Now this idea of primary and secondary and tertiary consumers is not an easy concept because you can be a primary consumer and a secondary consumer at exactly the same time. For instance, in this cheeseburger here, you're a primary consumer when you're eating the potatoes and the bun and the lettuce and tomatoes and pickles and onions and man, this is looking good. But you're a secondary consumer when you eat the hamburger. You're also a secondary consumer when you're eating the cheese because both of those came from cows and cows got their energy from the grass. And that makes you then a secondary consumer. But when you're eating those other things, you're a primary consumer. You're both in that same bite. Hmm. Well, let's go back to our food web. We can see that there are many autotrophs. The pondweeds, the cattails, the planktons. These are all of our primary producers. They are absorbing light energy from the sun and they are producing food. Our primary consumers are the tadpoles, uh, the mosquito larvae, and the water fleas because they're getting their energy directly from these autotrophs. But we also see examples of secondary consumers as well, like the minnows. The minnows ate the mosquito larvae that ate the plankton they're a secondary consumer. There's tertiary consumers on here as well. For instance, if we look at the frog, that would be a tertiary consumer because it ate the minnows, that ate the mosquito larvae, that ate the plankton. But let's take a look at something that's kind of complex here, the, like the great blue heron. Right? The great blue heron is a secondary consumer if it ate the catfish, that ate the pondweeds. It would be a tertiary consumer if it ate the frog that ate the tadpoles that ate the cattails. It can also be a quaternary consumer if it eats the yellow perch that ate the minnows that ate the mosquito larvae that ate the plankton. And so one organism can be any of these types of consumers just depending on what it eats. But again in an ecosystem you have very few tertiary and quaternary consumers because there just isn't enough energy to support a large population of that. Going back to our energy pyramid, we can see this pattern that sets up. Basically, we just got rid of a zero as we went up our energy pyramid. This is what's known as the 10% rule, which says that only 10% of the available energy can be used at the next highest trophic level. So again, if there's 510,000 kilocalories of energy at the producer level, there's only going to be 51,000 of that available or 10% for the primary consumers. Well, what's happening to that other 90%? Well, certainly the primary producers are using some of that energy themselves to, main, to maintain life, to keep themselves alive. Right? But besides that, anytime you transform energy, much of that energy gets lost in the form of heat. And so when one organism eats another, they don't get all of the energy that was in that organism. Much of it changes into heat. And so it comes out to about you only get 10% of the energy that's available. Now this has some ramifications for populations. If you want to feed a large population, well you definitely want to be a primary consumer. The more secondary consumers we have, the more food that it's going to take at the producer level to support that population. And if we're 
acting as a tertiary consumer, that means even more food at the producer level to maintain that population. So this is something that we're going to spend some time talking about. So I hope that gives you a better understanding as to how energy flows in an ecosystem.